take this one. Yeah. Okay. Arc just talks. Or yeah. yeah. So hi everyone, thank you very much for attending this talk. Um, I know it's not directly relevant to what you do. Hopefully I'm sufficiently IT savvy so I don't embarrass myself. Um, however, any input from your behalf would be welcome. So today I'm going to talk to you about blockchain smart contracts and arbitration. contracts and obviously I think that you know um, we're quite lagging behind um, the technology so this is why it's about right to actually start talking about this and to actually give you some advice on how to actually develop um, perhaps um, an arbitration system that is based on blockchain that could have um, to a certain extent some business success so you all know what this is I guess. Um, Bitcoin? Um, no? Okay, so um, this is um, basically um, the main sort of emblem that represents Bitcoin. And the most important part about Bitcoin is not the actual cryptocurrency anymore. It's kind of old news by now. Um, but it's the technology that it uses. So we've seen a shift from the use of blockchain technology in cryptocurrency to other types of uses. Um, so one of these uses are dispute resolution, more particularly arbitration. I'll tell you why arbitration is very specifically important here, um, as opposed to other types of um, dispute resolution methods. Um, but first, um, let me tell you a bit more about blockchain, and then I have a mini lecture um, about arbitration for you. Um, so for those who are not well aware of what blockchain technology, um, in my sort of legal analysis, I try to simplify the idea in order to explain it to a layperson. So sorry if I'm not technical enough. OK, so what is blockchain technology? Well, it's a distributed digital data structure. And this data structure consists of transactions that are actually found in blocks that constitute a ledger. So very simple. We have a block. It becomes part of a chain, blockchain. And this ledger is copied amongst the members of a network so that these can reach a consensus on how to organize the data and validate it. And this is what distributed means, basically. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, so the specificity of this technology is that it functions on a decentralized basis. In other words, there, no, there is no use of a trusted intermediary. Obviously, that was the most important part about cryptocurrency. Um, now, let's see how it actually applies to other uses of blockchain. But first, I have a diagram here for those who really don't know how to understand what I've just explained. Um, so user A requests a transaction. And this transaction is represented in a block. And the block is actually broadcast to every party on the network. And it's broadcast to every party on the network so that they can actually verify the authenticity of um, the transaction. And if it's authentic, then obviously um, they all uh, validate the transaction and a new block of data is created and it's added to the ledger. So it becomes part of the blockchain. Now after the transaction is complete, then obviously this uh, ledger is copied amongst all of the members of the network. Right. So now we come to something called smart contracts. How many of you have heard about this concept before? Right. So this is a bit of a legal um, concept that is sort of amalgamated with um, this blockchain concept. Now, smart contracts, some people call them blockchain 2.0. They actually use blockchain technology as a platform um, in order to function. Now, these were referred to first um, in the 1990s by Nick Jabo, who was a lawyer, but a computer scientist as well. And he said that he thinks that computer con sorry that smart contracts are a set of promises um, specified in digital form, including protocols within which the parties perform on these promises. So just imagine a normal contract, and imagine that this contract is actually fully automated or partially automated. So how does that work? Well, it's a software program that is actually stored on the blockchain. So it uses the blockchain as a technology 
However, instead of having each sort of transaction being individually requested, it actually processes everything that has been embedded on the software. So these software codes embed the terms and conditions of a contract, so it's a normal contract, normal agreement between two parties or more, um, and these software codes run on a network leading to a partial or full automated self-execution and self-enforcement of the contract. Now, as you can tell, for lawyers, this has created quite a revolution. What do you mean by having an automated performance of a contract? How does that happen? Well, obviously, the law is lagging behind at the moment. Um, so this is why it's very important to understand how this marries with arbitration. So any idea what arbitration is? Right. So the evil man here in the picture is the arbitrator. And normally, they're supposed to be nice, because the parties actually get to choose them. And they choose them, and this person actually makes a decision, which becomes binding on the parties. So normally, we have arbitration for business to business, parties, for example, or other types of um, arbitration, for example, between an investor and a state. But I won't complicate things too much for you, so we'll stick to the business to business model here, because this is what's of interest to us and to blockchain arbitration. So arbitration, for those who have not grasped that yet, is a private method of dispute resolution. So now, imagine you have a contract with someone, and you have a dispute, someone didn't pay. What do you do? You go to court. Okay, but in modern times, you don't really go to court if you have a business-to-business -business contract, because most of them refer to arbitral clauses. And if you have an arbitral clause, this means that you're excluding your right to go to court to resolve your dispute, and you're electing to actually go to resolve your dispute through arbitration. So in order to prove that you know, you've excluded this right, you obviously need an arbitration agreement. And this arbitration agreement needs to be written. Now, hold your thoughts here. So an arbitration agreement, we need that, and it needs to be written. Okay. And obviously then the parties have the right to choose and appoint their arbitrators. Uh, normally we have one or three arbitrators. And then uh, the parties also have the flexibility to choose whichever procedure and rules uh, that govern the procedure are. And at the end of the procedure, we get a decision, and it's called an arbitral award. Right. So just to take you through it again, we have an arbitration agreement, we have the proceedings, and then we have the end of the procedure with an arbitral award. So all is good. So it's quite similar to court proceedings, just that it's private. And the most important part about this private type of justice is that the decision is actually binding. It's final and binding, meaning that if the parties don't comply with the decision, then they can be sanctioned by the domestic court of where um, the parties are actually trying to enforce the decision. So it's very important to understand that you can't just choose not to respect the arbitral award. You actually have to comply with it. The law says so. Right. So why blockchain arbitration? Well, as I said, there are different uses um, that can be used for blockchain technology. One of them is supply chain management. Now, just if I take you through what supply chain is and what supply chain management is, well, you can imagine that we have raw material, so it's all the trade sort of um, connection here, uh, where you have raw, raw materials, you have a farmer, um, and then he sells his goods to the supplier, and then these goods are actually sent to the manufacturer who manufactures the goods. The manufacturer then has to use some type of transportation to transport them to the distributor, um, and then the distributor transports them to the retailer, and the retailer then obviously sends them to, consu to the consumer. So basically you. Now, this looks very nice on paper, However, this is a very complex procedure, um, and it consists of, of a lot of complex logistics procedures regarding payment, the transfer of documents, etc. Um, so many times, you actually have a lot of delays on this supply chain. Now, it takes days to make a payment, for example, between a manufacturer and a supplier, or a customer and a vendor. Sometimes, payment is not authenticated in an easy way. 
Also, contracts must be handled by lawyers and bankers for these payments, which obviously means extra cost and delay. Another one of these issues that arise uh, at the moment with regards to supply chains are that products and parts of products are often hard to trace back. In other words, uh, there's a very difficult visibility um, of where or how to trace back um, the product or the good to its source. So obviously, blockchain introduces a lot of solutions to these issues. Um, so blockchain can actually be used for any kind of exchange agreements or tracking. So I don't have to tell you, I'm sure you know, for those who are aware perhaps of uh, what blockchain is, is that basically if we adopt blockchain for these supply chain management, um, we can actually have a self-execution of these supply contracts. So for example, payment can all be automated. Um, and everything is on the cloud and it's visible for everyone. So everyone know, uh, knows what is going on. And that is essential. Right, so again, how is that related to arbitration? Well, if you have a supply chain, you're bound to have disputes that can arise um, or would arise from uh, proceedings of um, or the management of the supply chain. So if we incorporate um, a smart contract within the supply chain and we base it on the, uh, on the smart contract, then the question is, okay, if something goes wrong, because obviously no one's perfect, nothing's perfect, what happens? Do we need to have something to resolve the dispute or do we just wait for the system to self-execute itself? We get a decision or we get the actual result from the blockchain and then we go to court? Well, this can be a bit counterproductive. So one idea is to actually incorporate an arbitration clause within the smart contract. Basically, we can incorporate a code, an arbitration code within the smart contract that, function, that the supply chain is based upon. So as you can remember in arbitration, um, parties are allowed to actually um, choose whichever procedural rules they want to apply to their procedure. So this is why so far um, we don't have a specific sort of procedure uh, for smart contract arbitration. Uh, we have different designs. Now, one of them, and this is the one that I'm going to focus on, is Code Legit by Datarella. And actually, this was uh, the first mock arbitration. Um, so the first, sorry, mock arbitration that is based on smart contracts um, was through Code Legit. And then we, uh, we have another system called Kleros. And I have a, quite a number of issues with Kleros. I'll tell you some of them. Um, whilst I'm actually going to explain um, my analysis on code legit and basically to what extent um, the procedure of code legit is considered to be recognized by the law. So, as I said, with regards to smart contract arbitration, obviously it includes um, having a clause within the smart contract, and this clause is a code because obviously the smart contract consists of code. And code legit has called its um, arbitration clause the arbitration library. And the arbitration library is basically an arbitration software protocol within the smart contract. So just because I want to, people to suffer with me, I'm just going to explain to you what the procedure that was designed um, by code legit consists of. So don't worry, I'll read it to you because I actually have a hard copy. So you can listen up. Right. So the parties agree upon having a legal contract. Then they agree upon the smart contract. So they're saying first you have a typed normal classic contract, then you base it um, in code. Now, obviously, the smart contract starts running. And if there is a legal contract that is breached, then, basically, the parties will get a choice um, to trigger um, the arbitral process. So this is triggered by a code. Now, the arbitration uh, library then gives notice to the parties of, you know, whoever was appointed as an arbitrator, if they're happy, then that's fine, they move on. And 
once the parties send um, their memoranda, so their memoranda meaning you know, what their claims are, where, what their defenses are, uh, to the arbitrator, um, then the procedure starts. Now, where do you think the arbitrator is? Just a question. That's a trick question. Is he on Skype somewhere? Is he like physically present with the parties? Well, he's on Skype or some other electronic um, method. Because um, the specificity of smart contracts obviously is to cut on costs and time. Right, so this person who's online um, will decide what the eventual answer is or what the, the, the decision is. And once he actually issues the decision, if the parties are happy to, with it, then um, basically code legit says that the arbitrator can actually send um, a written um, notice of what, uh, or a written um, arbitral award to the parties if um, needed. Now, once uh, this award is issued, then the parties have the choice through the smart contract, and the arbitrator has the choice through the smart contract because the parties then tell him it's okay to do so, um, if they're happy with the decision that he had made. Um, well, either he can actually let the contract be, so not change anything. So the dispute happened, it got resolved, we don't need to change the contract, so it runs. Or the, the arbitrator might have to modify the contract. Eventually, if he needs to terminate it, then that's a possibility. And these are three different options that are given by the code on the system. Now, once this is triggered, then we have a decision that is automatically enforced. And this is the novelty here, and this is you know, the revolution. Um, that is being created here uh, with regards to arbitration, because arbitration is final and binding, and it's automatically enforced upon the party. So, for example, if um, the arbitrator finds that, for example, the seller um, was the one who was at the wrong, in the wrong here, then he will have to pay for the damages, and this will be automatically taken from his account. So, this could be quite problematic um, to some, so the question is, to what extent are blockchain arbitral awards or decisions recognized by the international legal framework? Now, obviously, here I'm talking international because supply chain management, you know, we don't live in the Stone Age. Even the Stone Age, perhaps, you know, there were international trade leads, who knows? Who knows? Um, but obviously, um, we do have an international element here. So um, it's important to understand that the main sort of uh, regulatory text um, on the matter is called the New York Convention on the Recognition and Enforcement of Foreign Arbitral Awards of 1958. It's quite a mouthful, um, but this is the main text um, that is used in arbitration, um, basically because in international arbitration, you have a decision that is made in arbitration in one country, the parties are not from that country, and most probably they will go to another country to try to implement the decision. So you see, we have to have some sort of collaboration between different states in order for their courts to actually implement the arbitral decision. So again, the question is, to what extent does the New York Convention actually recognize blockchain arbitral awards? So please don't fall asleep, but I'll just take you very quickly through this. Um, I just divided my analysis into a very um, easy parts for you to understand. So the first thing that I'll look at is the characteristics that the arbitral award in a blockchain system has. So it's an arbitral award that is in writing, if necessary, if you remember. Or, if it's not necessary, then the arbitral award can be authenticated in code, remember? Because then it's part of this chain of automation that will be automatically enforced. So the question is, is code considered to be a digital signature? Do we have a digital signature in code? Okay. So this is what I was wondering about. Um, and the New York Convention says nothing about what sort of signature um, there should be within an arbitral award. So it doesn't say whether the arbitrator 
needed to give an electronic signature or any other type of signature, it says nothing. Now, there are some favorable positions in this convention saying that, well, if you have a domestic legal system that says, oh, you know, you can actually enforce electronically signed um, arbitral awards, then that's fine. I'm happy with that. Please go ahead. I'll recognize it. But there's a limitation, and the limitation actually trickles down to domestic legal systems, because as you know, favorable as it can be, the New York Convention does say, well, you know, if the legal court, if the legal court, court system um, in a certain domestic state does not really, or is not really comfortable with this idea of digital signatures, it's okay, but you know, it can't really recognize um, this arbitral award. So, so far you can see that perhaps in some countries this might be accepted, so the code itself and having this um, a signature in the code could be recognized, however in others it won't be. So this is one of the limitations. Another um, aspect that I looked at with regards to the New York Convention and these arbitral awards under the blockchain is that under the blockchain or with regards to the code legit uh, system that is based on the blockchain, um, an arbitral award can be sent to the parties in writing by post. So again, if necessary. Or an arbitral award can also be sent by email. But we also know that it can be sent by code, because again, it's automatically enforced. So this is how the parties get to know about um, the award. Now, with regards to how an arbitral award should be communicated to the parties under this New York Convention, there's no mention at all on how it should be communicated. So perhaps it doesn't matter whether it can be sent by email or in code, this might be accepted. However, there's another limitation again. If there is no proper communication under the law at the place of arbitration, um, or that law considers that there has been no proper communication of the arbitral award, then this is a denial of justice and it's a ground for refusing to actually implement the arbitral decision. And lastly but not least, and I'm sorry if you're falling asleep, I hope you're not, um, I'm going to talk about the submission of, uh, the, uh, of the award for recognition to court. So whenever you have a normal court decision or a normal classic arbitral decision, you can actually go to court to recognize and enforce it in that sort of foreign country where you're trying to have it recognized. Well, again, through blockchain, we know that the specificity is that there's an automated enforcement of the award via the relevant protocol. So how does this apply under the New York Convention? Well, again, we have a limitation here. If there is a conflict with the domestic legal system under Article 4 of the New York Convention here in Article 3, if, digital signature, if a digital signature in a code is not considered to be an authentication um, of a signature of an arbitral award, then obviously this will be rejected and the arbitral award will not be recognized by that domestic legal system. So again, another fail by the New York Convention. And lastly, the question is, you know, is this automated enforcement of the award in conflict with domestic laws regarding recognition? Because it's called recognition and enforcement, so first we need to recognize it. Um, well, some countries don't allow that, like in France. So just to actually uh, pick your brains a bit, and I, I know I'm not, uh, I, I'm not within my time limit, um, but there's another interesting thing that I will actually um, throw at you. So how about, you remember the arbitrator who was on Skype or any other type of you know, electronic communication? Well, how about if he's an, not a person, it's an AI? Um, does the New York Convention apply to this case? And what are the challenges? Well, again, we run into issues, and mainly regarding signature and authentication. And some domestic legal systems, like for example in France, so far only allow for physical persons to act as an arbitrator. 
there are other issues regarding composition of the arbitral tribunal or the arbitration process that can also arise. For example, I'll tell you what from a layperson's perspective with regards to IT, or I try to be IT savvy, but obviously um, and not really. Um, I find it problematic to see how the AI came out with the decision. So perhaps we need some more transparency to understand how this decision was taken um, in order, for example, to avoid any sort of bias. So just as a conclusion, I have some legal suggestions for a successful blockchain arbitration model. And you'll see they're not very innovative. So the arbitral award needs to be in writing, like proper, you know, hard copy uh, writing. An arbitral award can be sent to the parties in writing by post and Notice, perhaps, and a grace period must be given to the parties through writing before having an automated enforcement of the award if we want to have a successful implementation of a blockchain system. However, obviously the law has lagged behind and this is why we have this sort of old school application so far, but hopefully things will change very soon. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sarah. So, how about this old school meeting new school, huh? Um, excellent. Who remembers who is the last speaker of the day? Let me see. This guy, no? <laughs>